Yes, good morning, Nigeria. Welcome to Daybreak, reaching you live from the nation's capital right here on Trust Television. I am Ayuba Ilya. Thank you for joining. Of course, I'm not alone, as always. Good morning, Stella. Good morning, Ayuba. Good morning, Nigerians. Thank you for joining us. My name is Stella Iyaji. Yeah, hoping, hoping that you had a great weekend uh, yep, this, I did. this time around. I did. All oh, right. And I was looking forward to be back. Yeah, that, right. that hasn't happened in a long time. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look at the headlines this morning. The national grid begins recovery after crashed to zero megawatts for seventh time this year. Child trafficking. Army arrests notorious trafficker rescues pregnant woman in Imo. Gunman abducts plateau traditional ruler. Now let's look at the details. The national grid crashed to zero megawatts at 10.51 a.m. on Monday, causing a, nation, a nationwide outage. The development occurred days after electricity consumers said they had enjoyed improved supply. The national electricity grid as, at 10 a.m. on Monday had 3,712 megawatts generated from 21 uh, uh, Gencos uh, before it dropped to zero megawatts one hour after. According to the information from the system operations, only a section of the transmission company of Nigeria, AFM4, was on the grid, but with zero supply as at 12 noon. As of Sunday, the highest generation was 4,100 megawatts, while the lowest was 3,652 megawatts. Since July 1st this year, consumers said power supply had increased in their various areas. Meanwhile, the national system operator's data showed that the grid which collapsed at 10.51 has commenced a gradual recovery. Officers of the 34 Aslari Brigade, Obinze, have arrested a suspected child trafficker, Joy Duru, from Idiotu, uh, south local government area of Imo State. The suspect allegedly specializes in stealing children from Imo State to sell to her accomplices in River State for a huge sum of money. Parading several suspects at the headquarters of the 34 Atlari Brigade, Obinze, in Imo State, the brigade commander, Sani Suleiman, said that the suspects were arrested after several months of intelligence gathering. Recovered from the suspect were forms said to have been gotten from teenage girls who get pregnant with the aim of selling the children upon delivery. The commander explained that efforts were ongoing to trace a suspected buyer of a two-week-old baby in River State. Meanwhile, the state commander of NAPTIP, Ernest Obu said that the suspects will be charged to court and necessary actions will be taken while efforts will be made to reunite the recovered children with their families. Now, gunmen in the wee hours of Monday abducted a traditional ruler in Tao Chiefdom of Pangchen, local government area of Plateau State. The abducted chief is the Ungolong Tal, a third class chief, Al Haji Dabu Gutus. The incident was said to have occurred at about 1 a.m. A resident of the chiefdom said the people are still trying to contact the abductors to know what the situation is at the moment. Prince Dakub Ezra, member representing Pakshin South State constituency, called for calm on the issue, saying that the safe return of the chief is paramount. He called on the people of the chiefdom and the constituency in general to go about their normal businesses and refrain from any act of provocation or taking the law into their hands. When contacted, the police public relations officer of the Plateau State Command, Alabo Alfred, confirmed the incident, adding that investigation was ongoing. All right, so let's take a look at some packages this morning. A large number of people, mostly women and children, from Baburuga, Barawa, Ansoni, Kaladu, Sabongari, and Badaka communities have moved into the ancient city of Katsina. The people fled their villages to escape the insecurity, leaving all their belongings behind. Abdullahi Amadi interviewed some of them and files in this report. <laughs> These displaced people arrived Katana confused, without food and shelter, and since they have nowhere to go, they are at the mercy 
of the elements. The reason for the flight was the massing up of terrorists armed with dangerous weapons around their villages planning to launch attacks. The terrorists, they say, had even threatened to burn down their villages if they made any attempt to inform security operatives about their presence and whereabouts. <laughs> The terrorists were first seen gathering around 5 p.m. at Baikiawa, one of the scenes of recent attacks on other villages, prompting the villagers to inform security operatives. But the help did not arrive until 8 p.m when the Nigeria Air Force fighter planes on other security operatives were mobilized to disperse the terrorists. However, by then, the people had started their migration to Katsina City. <laughs> Observers say at the wake of this heightened insecurity in Kazma State, a huge humanitarian crisis is imminent. Abdullahi Ismayamadi, Crossed Television News, Kazana. Thank you, Abdullah Yamadi, for that report. Now let's take a look at a major environmental issue. The Nigerian Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, has predicted flooding in 27 states, including the FCT. Now motorists around Jabi Motor Park in the FCT have expressed concern over flooding that have submerged the roads. Usman Be Bello visited Jabi and files in this report. This is Jabi Moto Park, one of the major interstate travel parks in Nigeria's FCT. This very busy road that connects Jabi to Utaku Market and Uye in Abuja has become a major worry for road users during the rainy season. Motorists say this road at the entrance of the park faced annual flooding, but this year has worsened as a result of the illegal structures were demolished, which as a result blocked the waterways. So we are here since this road as it is every day, now so they be every year when the rain starts falling. So for this year, because of this demolition that happened here, all the drainage that we are this year, you don't block, every year don't block. This place is falling our tire, and for a person like me, my tire is bought like two for that route. The road has become a public nuisance for commuters and those in the transport business say they have incurred heavy financial losses. This water has constituted, has been constituted constituting a menace, disturbing my activities, loading and offloading activities for the past two years. As we are seeing, it is not the excess damper that constitutes this water. We were told from the Liquid Waste Department of Abuja Environmental Board that there is a structure that differed from a sewer line that connected the Jabi axis to Utako axis. Authorities have said this year's flooding is one of the worst in over a decade. Lives and properties have been lost with thousands displaced in some parts of the country. Usman Bello, Trust TV News, Abuja. All right, thank you, Usman Bello. Now, the Nigerian Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, has predicted flooding in 27 states, including the FCT. Motorists around Jabi Motor Park in the FCT have expressed concern over flooding that has submerged the roads. Usman Bello has more on this. 
Oh, beg your pardon, we took the wrong story. Now, a federal high court in Abuja on Monday has fixed no November 11 to begin hearing in a suit by the leader of the Islamic movement in Nigeria, otherwise known as Shiite, Ibrahim El Zazaki, seeking an order compelling the Nigeria Immigration Service to release his international passport and that of his wife. Trustee Vizifu Suleiman has more. According to counsel for El Zazaki and his wife Zinat, the duo had their passports seized by the Nigerian authorities after their aborted trip for medical attention to India while in DSS custody, which were not returned to them even after their acquittal by a court in Kaduna. The applicants have now approached the court seeking an order to compel the Nigerian Immigration Service to issue them new passports to enable them travel for medical attention. We requested for the passport from DSS and NIA because they were in, his, in their custody when Sheikh Ibrahim Zekzaki and his wife returned from aborted medical trip to India. NIA and uh, DSS officials seized their passports. Now we have written to DSS and NIA requesting them to issue, to uh, return the passport, but they replied us, all of them replied us that the passport is not with them. So the best thing for us is to get a new passport. We have processed the, uh, we have followed the procedure for issuance of new passport, but the immigration services have refused to comply, despite the fact that we have fulfilled all the criteria. Recall at previous proceedings, the trial judge Justice Obiora Egualto had earlier granted a request by the counsel to the National Intelligence Agency, NIS, to join his client and DSS as respondents in the suit. Though counsel to the respondents was not available to comment on day's proceedings, the case has been adjourned to the 11th of November for hearing. Shabir Suleiman, Trust TV News, Abuja. Thank you, Shafir, for that report. Now let's look at some political matters. Campaigns for the 2023 elections will begin on September 28, according to the timetable re released by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. In Makodi, Jimmy Adzande speaks to residents on the expectations from those seeking political power in the country. Let's take the report. Almost all political parties have constituted campaign councils ahead of the commencement of campaigns. For Makudi residents, the next president of Nigeria, as well as governors and members of the National Assembly, should be people who understand the level of social crisis like unemployment has degenerated to and their plans of addressing the problems. What I expect in 2023 election is I expect a transparent government. I expect a government that will provide jobs for people like us that are unemployed. Uh, so I have to vote so that I'll be able to, to select a right leader, uh, one that we at least we do what we the masses expect from them. We can see there are a lot of unemployment around the, 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 the country. So if we have somebody that understands the, the problem of the country, I know that we will have a, a headway that will change the country to better. Leaders that can put uh, food on our table, leaders that can improve infrastructure. We expect leaders like be mindful of people's feelings. We expect leaders that can lead us very well. Some of the residents seek more youth-friendly leaders, saying this is the only way the country can make considerable progress, as it is the case in the developed countries. I use as suffrage, comparing to other countries in Africa, where more than them, all they do is they come together and find ways that will move country forward not to embark on play games. That is what we expect from them. We are expecting for them to embark and invest in education is very, very important. There is just no way that the country will develop beyond its level of education. There is a wave of political awareness going on in the state. Individuals and groups have undertaken to discourage voter apathy and galvanize support for their parties as well as candidates of their choices. Observers submitted that the 2023 election will be interesting to watch because of the personalities involved 
at different levels. All right, now the need to ensure that the right of girls and women to engage in civil society, vote and be voted for in elections, serve on boards and make their voices heard in any process that will affect them, their families and their communities is protected, has been emphasized. To this end, the Nigeria Orientation Agency is partnering the National Action for Women agenda to flag of a project that aims to boost women's active participation in politics ahead of the 2023 general elections. Noel Samson has more on this. Proponents of greater participation by women in politics say such engagement results in tangible gains for democracy, including greater responsiveness to citizens' needs, increased cooperation across party, and ethnic lines, and a more peaceful society. These and others necessitated the unveiling of NAWA project on promoting peace in Nigeria through women engagement by the National Action for Women Agenda, NAWA, in cooperation with NOE and the Ministry of Special Duties and Intergovernment Affairs. The Director General of NOE, Garba Abari, highlighted the role of women in politics and the dependence of gender inclusion in politics for national growth. The purpose of today's event is essentially to promote sustainable peace and justice, ensure good governance, and a peaceful coexistence among all Nigerians. It is gratifying to note that NAWA not only believes, but also commits to promoting youth and women empowerment social justice, human rights, and of course campaigns against gender-based violence in Nigeria through advocacy, public enlightenment, dialogue, vocational skills training, seminars, workshops, and conferences among others. Stakeholders at the event were brought up to speed with the idea behind NAWA and what it stands for. Whosoever that will want to come up to contest in any area, either as a president, governor, and other various political this thing women should be involved. We want the women to be involved 40%. Effective women representation in politics, stakeholders believe will increase creativity and help diversify the pool of talent, skills, and abilities. Well, Samson, Trust TV News, Abuja. Thank you, Noel Samson, for that report. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll look at what the newspapers are saying today. Stay with us. As the 2023 elections draw near, remember, evil prospers when good men and women only wish for peace, but never take a step to make peaceful elections happen. Are you a father? Are you a mother? What are you saying to your children as elections approach? Have you warned them not to let themselves be used to cause violence? Have you explained to them what the consequences of electoral violence might be? Do your part to make peaceful elections happen. Talk to your children. Protect them from unscrupulous politicians who want to put them in harm's way while their own children are comfortable at home, within and outside the country. Let's join hands to make 2023 elections peaceful. This message is from the National Orientation Agency, NOAA.
necessarily uh, tribal or regional. Thank you for staying. This is Daybreak reaching you from Trust Television right here in the nation's capital in Abuja. Time for us to take a look at the dailies on Daybreak. And we have in the studio Dr. Teoflos Abba. He's the director of Daily Trust Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us on Daybreak Thank you. this morning. And thank God that we are alive. Yes, indeed. All right, so let's begin with the Daily Trust newspaper. The lead story there says disquiet in APC over composition of campaign team. Uh, it has a writer that says, Osi Bajo, uh, Amechi's silence raises dust. You also have council fails to issue letters to nominees. Tinubu begins campaign with prayer session. We are open to working with all, says spokesman, and you will find all of that on page four. And next, uh, at the top, uh, above the lead story, says FG backtracks, withdraws order to reopen universities. That's on page six. INEC warns parties, candidates against hate speech. That's on page 25. Bandits kill police inspector. Three others abduct dozens in Kaduna and Katsina on page 27. Flood cuts off. Uh, Lokoja Highway, submerged houses and worship centers. That's on page 27. Above that, you would see the pictorial showing you how devastating uh, the flood incident was. And then oil price dips to $85 per barrel. You'd find that on page 19. On paid allowances, ex-service men take protest to defense headquarters on page 23. Man visits Lagos police station to bail friend, steals policeman's phone. And that's on page 17. That's that for the Daily Trust newspaper. And of course, not forgetting that it's 467 days after the Brindin Yawuri abduction. We still have 11 schoolgirls uh, of the FGC Brindin Yawuri uh, in custody of the uh, abductors. One student of Bethel Baptist High School. Uh, Kujama, 440 days after the abduction. All right, now let's take a look at the Punch newspaper. It has a lead story that says, 24 hours to campaigns. INEC, Khan, Sultan, one parties, supporters against violence. The first writer says, commission to publish voter register January 2023. SGF sues for peace. Avoid utterances, actions capable of causing violence. This is coming from Sawonlu Yakubu. Afenifere justifies obese endorsement. Tinubu's team fumes, tackles Adibanjo. Beneath that, uh, and beneath the Victoria of the Amotekun court, we have a, a, a story that says Amotekun. Akeridolu insists on arms. Afenifere knocks federal government. Also, Ogun communities lament 100 year darkness. Electricity project rots. ICPC sets up committee to manage forfeited assets. Just by the masthead, uh, Atiku names Saraki, Ayim, other special advisors. And above the masthead, federal government reverses Varsity's reopening order, ASU adamant. Remove petrol subsidy, implement PIA, LCCI tells federal government. Group demands sanctions as power collapses seventh time. Also, mobile transactions hit 11 trillion, 11 trillion naira in eight months. This is based on the report. These are the major stories on the Punch newspaper for today. All right. So let's take a look at the Nation newspaper next. Uh, it has the lead story that says, Akeridolu, no going back on plan to arm Amotekun Corps. Weapons procurement will be backed by law. Outfit needs tools to carry out its duties. You also would have other stories above the masthead that says, Tinubu Shetima joined ticket best for women. And that's uh, uh, on page five of the nation. Then Atiku bypass Wike allies, names Saraki, Oinlola, 
advisors. You'd find that on page 28. And then 2,119 miners owing federal government 2.76 billion naira, says RMAFC. We have bandits kill three, kidnapped 22 in Kaduna communities. Below the pictorial, you'd find the story that says, Don't plunge Nigeria into crisis. Khan, Sultan, warn religious leaders. You'd also find federal government reverses order, urging VCs to reopen universities. These are the stories on the nation newspaper. And on this day newspaper for today, Autumn breaks with Wiki, says he's not supporting Ayush removal. And the writer, the first writer, says, reaffirms confidence in his ability to lead party to victory. PDB stakeholders pressure Atiku to prevail on chairman to quit. Dino Melai is saying this, we're not threatened by our competitors. Ex-Vice President appoints Saraki Ayim Shekarel, secondus other special advisors. And above that, Akerodolu Amotekun must be given arms to carry out its duties. Also on this day, Nigeria's troubled power grid collapses again, begins recovery. We also have another story here. This is coming from INEC. In 2023, clear winners must call highest votes in poll, one third of votes in two thirds of 36 states. Also, uh, coming from Adebanjo, why Afeni Ferrer is supporting Peter Obi's presidential bid. These are the major stories on the this day newspaper. All right, the next story, uh, the next paper rather, is the Guardian newspaper. We have uh, the lead story there says, INEC unveils ground rules for hit-free issue-based campaigns. And then you would also would find uh, FG makes U-turn withdraws order to reopen universities and you have orgy of killings abductions in plateau uh, kaduna you would see also above the lead story market prices at higher risk ahead of mpr's decision no going back on beavers e-transmission of results INEC insist kaduna terrorist threatened to kill housewife baby others in 48 hours then ex-lawmaker kicks against state anniversaries, hails uh, Emmanuel's feats. Uh, so these are the stories about in, in the front page of uh, the Guardian newspaper. And the leadership newspaper has a lead story that says, another transition begins tomorrow as INEC lifts ban on campaigns. Electoral body NBC declare hate speech, abusive slogans, no-go areas. APC launches electioneering with prayers, peace walk on Wednesday. Article names Saraki Ayim Onyilola, second special envoy, uh, special and technical advisors. Then we, uh, Tinubu, Shatima, Wiki, Autumn, others still in London. Also, we have a story here that says 2023, guard your entrances. This is uh, Sultan Khan, one religious leaders. Will arm Amotekun Akeridolu vows. We can't replace Shekarao's name as NMPP senatorial candidate. This is coming from INEC. Also, we have a national grid begins recovery after seventh collapse in nine months. Bandits kill three, kidnap 22, threatening to kill siblings, newborn. These are the major stories on the leadership newspaper. All right, so these are the papers that we have for this morning. Uh, we'll now take perspectives on some of these stories. Uh, like we told you, Dr. Theophilus Abba, Director, Trust, uh, Daily Trust Foundation, uh, is with us to give perspectives. Thank you again for joining us on Daybreak. Now, let's begin with the Daily Trust newspaper. Uh, as always, the lead story here about the disquiet in APC over the composition of campaign team. Quite a lot of uh, revelations following the composition of that team. We are now understanding that Oshibajo, the vice president, is not on the list. Um, also, one of the presidential aspirants at the time during the primaries, uh, Roti Mamechi, is also not on the list. And uh, they've you know, uh, been kind of quiet, such that it's now raising suspicion. I mean, they are not the only ones, but <laughs> these are the two mm -hmm. that... Uh, 
Okay, um, I I know that um, at the weekend there were reports that uh, the president uh, removed the name of um, his uh, deputy, Simbajo, uh, from uh, the campaign uh, council. I think Simbajo's name, from what we read, was removed. Then the secretary to government federation's name was removed, and few others. And then um, the the reason given by um, the campaign team was that the president wanted the uh, Usim Bajo and those who are critical to the administration uh, to remain and uh, do the job, you know, to keep the government uh, I mean, going so that um, they are not caught in the, this, uh, I mean, going from one part of the country to another in the name of campaign and then allow governance to suffer. So we have heard that. Um, for that of Amici, well, it's not really very clear, you know, why uh, he was not there, you know. So, I mean, it depends on, on, on the party now, mm. you know, to uh, see. Uh, exactly. And if you look at people like Amici, mm. who actually resigned his office as yes. a minister mm. uh, to vie for the presidential seat and eventually lost, uh, he's now still a party mando. Mm. And then you also have Adebayashi, the former minister of communications, yes. who is also been involved with, you know, some kind of support group, you know, for, you know, uh, Sir Ajibola Ahmed Chinubu, still not on the list as well. Mm -hmm. So Well, I, I'm thinking that, you see, uh, it is prerogative of the party and um, the candidates, you know, to decide who is on the list. But the uh, consequence of uh, some of these characters not being on the list is that uh, um, the, the areas that they have uh, maybe supporters, you know, uh, may not uh, be available for the presidential candidate. For instance, Amici is expected, you know, to be able to woo the south-south geopolitical zone for uh, Tinubu. You know, at, at, the, at the moment, we see Wiki has a kind of a uh, dominating figure. You know, like he's the main uh, political mobilizer in that area. And uh, we thought that uh, Wiki, I mean, yes, Amici should be able to checkmate him in the south-south. So if Amici is not there, I mean, one, be, one begins to get worried. So how is uh, Tinubu going to manage uh, the South South geopolitical zone? Well, well, but this uh, lead story on the Daily Trust also stated clearly that since he lost at the primaries, we, have, uh, we haven't really seen Amici drumming support for the candidate of the APC. Mm. Yeah, he has said it uh, severally. I mean, from his utterances, I think he is not um, happy that uh, Tinubu got that ticket, you know, because uh, I've listened to him again and again, you know, at the point he was even saying where people sold their, I mean, delegates sold their votes, you know, some of them are regretting that they did so. And uh, maybe they had approached him, we don't know, we didn't hear from, uh, from him. Perhaps they had approached him and said, look, I, know, I want to be left out of uh, and the whole of this campaign issue. I'm not convinced, you know, yeah, if anyone is not convinced about being on uh, uh, I mean, I mean, supporting the candidature of anyone that uh, you cannot compel them to, to well, be on the campaign council. Well, the campaign is just uh, barely 24 hours away. Um, apart from the, the APC, where there is disquiet, the, the PDP too is also having problems with this campaign team. Why do you think it's happening at this point? I mean, the primaries held over two months ago. Mm. No, I, but there's a difference between what is happening in APC and what is happening in the PDP. Like, if you look at the PDP, at least we have. Some of the uh, those contest against the uh, um, article, you know, joining the article team now, people like Saraki, people like Anyim, you know, they were uh, part of the primary election, and article has been able to to rein them in and made them uh, special advisors. So I'm I'm thinking that, I mean, the two parties have their issues. It's only Wiki, you know, that. Um, is it only Wiki? You know, very bitter. In the, is in the, it in only Wiki because we have PDP. a whole lot of others with Wiki as well. I mean, Go that is Governor he has his team. Day of Oyo State. Mm. We still have I'm talking about those who Plateau contested State. against uh, against Atiku. You know, okay. among those who contested against Atiku, mm. it's only Wiki that is blowing hot. You know, uh -huh. but if you get to um, the APC, you know, almost all of them. Okay, it's not even only Amichi. What of Obuna You know, we are not hearing about Obuna any any longer. Uh, if, I mean, he, I mean, in uh, fact, he didn't even show up during the primaries. Be, no, no, okay, no, no, you, uh, you, he spoke. Um, Sorry, Emeka and Wajiba. Emeka and Wajiba, he has disappeared, you know, mm -hmm. he has disappeared. So there's this kind of bitterness 
I mean, in both uh, APC and the, and the PDP. And I don't think that is good for, uh, for the election. You know, you have this kind of bitterness. People are not happy, people are angry. You know, I don't think the, I mean, the campaign will be very, very smooth. Now, mm. now uh, we are seeing in the case of the PDP that there's another twist to the whole thing. Uh, the this day newspaper this morning is leading with uh, a story that says that uh, uh, Otom breaks with Wike says he is not supporting IU's removal. So again, that gives it another dimension. I know. I think I don't think Otom has ever said that he wanted IU to be removed. I don't think he has ever said. So you go and check. You know, um, Otom uh, supports, uh, uh, I mean, it's an alliance with Wiki. I mean, maybe in principle. But he has never said that, Ot I mean, uh, I mean, Ayu, Ayu should be removed. And I think that headline is the measure of uh, exaggeration. There's an exaggeration there. He, I mean... So, well, he, so to what extent is the alliance between Otom and Wiki? If, because one of the uh, Wiki's major... Uh, concern mm. is Ayus, uh, Ayus removal from as chairman of the PDP. No, so okay. Let's look at the sequence. To what extent is that alliance? Let's look at the sequence. You see, Otom, I mean, has always felt that power should go to the south. I mean, he has never hidden that. And if you if you are listening to him again and again, he is not comfortable that. Let me put it this way: another full and person will take over. If PDP won, wins because of his experience with um, the Hadas and all those crises with the Fulani and all those things, he has never hidden that. And if he has said it again and again that look, all things being equal, the South should pr uh, produce uh, the next uh, uh, PDP uh, presidential candidate. So at that level, there is an agreement between him and, and Wiki. But to say that um, Ayu must be removed as uh, as chairman. Tom has never has never said that, you know. Tom has never. But said then, that how else chairman. will the party now? Balance because removing on? Ayu, removing Ayu is like, <clears throat> you know, because there are a lot of arguments around it. Number one, um, the party always has this way of zoning positions. If the presidency comes from the north, the chairman of the party comes from the south. At the time Ayu was, um, I, I mean, elected as chairman of the uh, PDP. You know, the, the, the ticket went to the North Central. We're expecting that, oh, the president will come from the South. That was the assumption, you know. But now, <clears throat> the party has not won that uh, presidential uh, election. If the party wins the presidential, presidential election, they should be thinking about removing the chairman, you know, bringing another person from the South to be the chairman of the party. And Ayu knows this. I mean, Otom knows this very well. It is not at the point of election that you remove the chairman. It is at the point where the election has been won that the chairman that you now begin to, uh, I mean, uh, rejig the leadership of the of the party. And Otom knows this very well. And uh, saying that he has, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, that, that Otom is no longer with Wiki conclusively, based on the fact that so, he said, "Look, so I'm not supporting Ayu's removal." I mean, it's too. So is uh, Wiki not aware of this? That. I mean, w w they shouldn't expect resignation before the eventual election, before the, the candidate em emerged eventually as president, if he does. Oh, in, uh, as far as the party's constitution is concerned, that is what it's supposed to be. But as for Wiki, I mean, he's pressing uh, for the removal of Ayu on other grounds. One of them is allegation of corruption. You know, you know he is saying that, look, this man was chairman. Or but chairman but was the major biased. reason he has emphasized the removal of IU is because of the issue of balancing the party structure, the party mm. leadership structure. Yes, but he's doing it for the sake of argument. But in reality, what happens is that it is only when the election is won, when Atiku becomes president, that you cannot say, okay, now Atiku is president, we cannot, no, but not at the level of running for an election. Then at this point, maybe the issue of uh, balancing shouldn't even come in. It shouldn't. Maybe it should just be about the allegations so far. Yes. Because I also saw a statement by Juna Jang of mm. Plateau State where mm. he made some allegations against the chairman of the party. Uh, his, the, the, his, the way he conducted himself during the primaries was one of the things it's that... It's one of the uh, allegations Jang that raised. they have, have leveled against. You see, the, the, the PDP, I mean, uh, let me say there was a kind of confusion in the party. You know, because everybody was thinking that, oh, 
how do we win this election? If we run, if we field a northern candidate, that's when we win the election. You know, and that to some extent uh, may just be uh, what I would call, uh, I mean, a, a, a product of fear, you know. But going by what the party has done over the years, you know, if the presidency, uh, if, if, the, if the president of the country for eight years came from the south, from the north, then the next president should come from the south. No matter how you decide to argue it. All right. So uh, campaigns are about to begin uh, from tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, with all of this conflict in both, uh, in, I would say in, the, in these two major political parties, uh, how is this going to you know, impact on their campaigns and eventually uh, the election in 2023? Well, um, the, the major challenge is that uh, if there is no harmony um, in the parties, if there's no harmony in the parties, you know, then we fear that there will be a lot of maybe hate speech, a lot of hatred, a lot of violence may even uh, erupt. You know, the tendency is that um, if a candidate is approaching, uh, is going to a zone that, I mean, has, that has, let me put the word, political enemies, you know, it may not be received there, uh, I mean, the way it ought to have been re received. So we, I, I fear that there could be violence, you know, during the campaign. And I fear that there will be a lot of hate speech spread. Violence during the campaign, I, I don't get that because this uh, confusion right now is within the parties. It's not against both parties yet. It's within the parties getting their acts together before the campaign. No, it's within proper. the parties, but all the party, I mean, leaders, the guys who are bickering, you know, they have their strongholds. For instance, if uh, if if uh, if um, it's, I mean it's one of those who is against the candidate comes from village A, he will say, okay, I don't want this guy to come to my village to come and campaign. If he comes, my talk should attack. That is the kind of thing that that I fear could happen, you know, because. <clears throat> If what what you're trying to say is that there could be members of the same party who, who work against their own of candidates. Course, That's what be. you're trying to say. There, there could be. There could be members of the same party. Who, for instance, I mean, I, I, I expect that there should be a lot of security alert in the South-South. I expect that, that that should be done. Security operating must be at alert in the South-South. You know, and in some parts of, I mean, other parts of the country should be at alert because if there's this kind of bitterness, it means that... for. I mean, if, for instance, if Atiku goes to maybe rivers to campaign, you know, you know, he has to be very careful. I'm not saying that he'll be attacked, but he has to be very, very careful, you know, about what will happen there. You know, so that's why I'm, I'm thinking that this campaign may witness a lot of violence. And now that we have um, uh, all sorts of, I mean, crisis, insecurity, you know, across the country, you know, any violence, can be uh, pinned on any, any um, non-state actor. Mm. All right, so in the, for options, in, the, in terms of options before Nigerians now, mm -hmm. uh, with all these conflicts, now, do you see that these two political parties can actually uh, make the most you know, of the opportunities before them? You mean options in terms of who to that vote is, for? Yes, th that's for Nigerians now, mm. generally. Mm. Well, uh, during the campaign, we expect the parties to unfold their agenda, you know, to tell us this is what we're going to do. This, this are our, I mean, programs, these are the strategies we're going to employ. So Nigerians, I mean, should be, uh, should be attentive, you know, to, I mean, to know who, I mean, has credible uh, programs and projects, I mean, and strategies that would, uh, that would deliver the country from this current uh, problem. Because we have a lot of problems in this country today. We want to see how we can come out of the debt crisis. Do you, do you see these campaigns going to be issue-based? Because we have had campaigns where it's just one party attacking the other party or attacking individuals, as it were. Well, the, I mean, right from, as of now, we are seeing a lot of uh, attacks on personalities, seeing a whole lot of it. And um, that is not the right thing. Nigerians are listening. You know, it's supposed to be issue-based, but as of now, I mean, we have not seen, I mean, the, I mean, the candidates, I mean, discussing issues. We have not seen them. Although I know Atiku, I mean, is launching some books. Is it tomorrow or, or, or when? And those books are supposed to signpost what he's going to do. But then we have not seen clearly how, I mean, these candidates are going to deliver us from the current uh, 
I mean, predicate. We have not seen, seen them yet. So we're expecting that, I mean, they should come up with ideas. How are you going to get us out of the debt crisis? How are you going to deal with unemployment? How are you going to deal with well, this issue called subsidy, fuel subsidy? How are you going to handle it? How are you going to deal with insecurity? You know, because I these mean, are the things I that mean, Nigerians we, are listening we, 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 to. All this bickering within the parties, um, um, it's almost as if no one is even paying attention to the real problems, to the real issues that Nigerians are actually yearning for. Uh, because, I mean, the, the major political parties are carried away by, you know, the power tussle, mm -hmm. the power sharing arrangements, mm -hmm. you know, even before the election and all of that. Meanwhile, you know, expectedly, the parties are supposed to be talking about their party manifesto. They are mm -hmm. supposed to be talking about how do we deal with this issue, how do we deal with that issue, and the rest of them. Those are the things we're supposed to be, I mean, listening to, because the... You no, know, there is no way you can tell us that you want to be president and we cannot predict what you will do. And for us to predict what you will do, I mean, we have to hear from you. We have even had instances where people have accused members of their party of sharing portfolio even before the elections. And one will be wondering, at this point, is that what we should even be talking about? When, when, when you talk about uh, power sharing, I think... Um, one of the things that will motivate politicians to work for any candidate is the promises that have been made to them. You know? Shouldn't the focus so, be on how to get it first? Yes, for us, for us who are supposed to, who are going to vote, you know, we should know what uh, what they are planning. But for politicians who are who are going to invest a lot of resources, they want to know what they will get. You know, I think it's uh, it's, it's it's normal in uh, every. I mean. Uh, political uh, uh, engagement to know what is in need for. But then our own concern is, look, we need a system that can deliver from our predicament. That is my major concern. Mm. All right, well, uh, let's talk about other issues now. Uh, we have the issue of Amotekung again uh, on the lead story. We have, uh, I think it's the, the Punch, or I would say the, the Nation newspaper leads with uh, story that says uh, Akira Dolu is saying that no going back on plan to arm Amotekun Corps. Uh, so it appears that there's this problem of uh, equipping Amotekun with the you know weapons that they need to be able to uh, carry out their duties and uh, yet we have seen that uh, more and more states are coming up with their own arrangements like in Zamfara for instance uh, to be able to uh, guarantee the safety of lives uh, and all that. Mm -hmm. So why are we stuck in this? Like we have, yes, sometimes we blame the state. We say, oh, the state should go ahead and do what they need to do to, you know, bring about security in their states. I mean, they are the chief uh, security officers of their states. But when they make steps, when they take steps, they get stuck at some point. Still takes us back to the issue of having state policing. Don't you think? Well, I think the mood of the nation um, is in support of what uh, Akira Doli is uh, saying, you know, because we have a shortage of uh, security personnel. Let me put it that. I think that is the that is the, that is how raw we can put it. You know, it's the way by many communities are not protected. It's the way by uh, we people are very vulnerable to attacks and people just get killed, get kidnapped, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. You know, one is kidnapped, and the police will say, "Well, uh, if they um, if they call you, negotiate with them, make sure you are careful, you know, because there's nothing we can do. So we cannot continue to run a country like that, you know. So uh, that, that's why the issue of Amotekun even came up in the first place. If we had more policemen, and we've been campaigning for the recruitment of policemen, I think the president uh, said that, that they were going to recruit 10,000 policemen every year. It hasn't happened." And if you go to a typical, uh, I mean, Nigerian rural community, you, how many policemen are there? In my village, there is no policeman. And so you, you, you now discover that, you now, you now discover that because of this shortage of, I mean, personnel, security personnel, these guys who engage in violence, they don't do it uh, freely. So they, they are, I mean, I think that it is time for government to realize the need for the state police and effectively. I mean, amend the constitution to allow states to recruit policemen that can manage 
uh, security, I mean, uh, across the country. But as I today, the number of policemen that we have are not enough. And that is why uh, the issue of Ambotekun is coming up. That is why even in the southeast, you have ESN. I mean, they are claiming that uh, mm. where well, they are providing well, security. You, you have made the point that we need state police. However, the fear is still there. And that's the fear of these people behaving the way they like attacking people indiscriminately. This ESN that you mentioned, you, rem you recall not too long ago, they mm. shot some people who went for a wedding mm. uh, uh, celebration in Imo State. Now, so that fear is there. And now, w that fear has not been tackled. So arming them fully, is that the way to go? Well, I don't know. Because if you don't arm them, how do they challenge the... Um, the, I mean, the, the, the bandits and the, the, the criminals, you know, that attack and, 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 uh, and, uh, and kill. You know, because, you see, if you are a security man, and we have heard again and what again... What can be even, done even before policemen. arming them? What should be done before no, arming they them? Are, they have to be proper training, you know. First, first of all, we have to pass a law that will guarantee, I mean, that will empower states to have state police. I think that is what the National Assembly ought to have done. We keep saying that if you pass this law and the governors have police, they use against their enemies, they use against their opponents. It doesn't, I mean, the police, policemen have a lot of work to do other than just pursuing the opponents of, uh, of governors. There's a whole lot of work to do. So if we pass the law to say, okay, states can have uh, a policemen, then these policemen are trained, properly trained. They are given uh, the rules of engagement and they must abide by the rules of engagement. If you violate it, you are punished. If you kill indiscriminately, you are arrested and detained. And maybe even, uh, I mean, maybe the law will have to take its course. But we cannot keep saying that, oh, uh, Motin cannot bear arms, and then we we'll have some guys in the bush killing people, and we we'll have some criminals shooting and, 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 and going away with it. I mean, nobody to challenge them. If you, if you have listened to policemen who have confronted uh, uh, these uh, criminals, they will tell you that, look, their weapons were more superior. You are just carrying a batting, and somebody is carrying AK-47. You know, I mean, there's no match. And that is why criminality is on the, is on the increase, in spite of, I mean, what uh, government claims uh, uh, is achieving. Mm -hmm. So I'm, f I'm feeling that if we don't want uh, Amoteku to bear arms, then we have to approve, I mean, this idea of a state police so that, every st so that we can have more security personnel to protect the country. I mean, in any case, uh, the sub-nationals are already having one form of uh, yes. arrangement or the other that have Even a semblance. If, if you go, if you go to Bono State, the, state police. the civil rights JTF has done a whole lot. The civil rights, they, they have done a whole lot to, to tackle the, uh, the uh, terrorists in, in Bono State because they provided intelligence. I mean, they, uh, some of them are even so daring that uh, they can go to the camps of uh, these uh, uh, terrorists and, uh, I mean, disorganize them. So I am thinking that we need more security personnel. Mm. All right. All right, so uh, quite a number of issues here, still on security issues. We have, uh, the, according to reports, bandits kill police and three others uh, abduct dozens in Kaduna and Katsuna yesterday. Uh, in fact, earlier we saw a report of how uh, some communities uh, fled their homes into uh, Katsuna City and all of that. That's points, uh, that still points us back to the issue mm. of uh, insecurity uh, in the country. Well, I think that that's that uh, for this morning, uh, yeah. as much as we can take. Thank you so much for joining us on Daybreak. Thank you. Uh, we look forward to having you again. Thank you, thank you. Our uh, guest reviewer, Dr. Theophilus Abba, the director of Daily Trust Foundation, uh, giving us perspectives on the stories on the front pages this morning. We'll take a short breather now, and then when we return the program, we'll continue. Please stay with us. <music>
To every politician, as the campaigns gain momentum and passions begin to rise, remember the errors of your opponents do not make you a success. Do not run down your opponent and inflame passions to violence between and among your supporters. What counts is what you plan to do for the electorate and how you intend to relieve the sufferings and bring succor. Nigeria is in dire need of patriotic leaders at all levels. Leaders who will make national development their priority. Concentrate on telling the electorate what you intend to do when you get into office. Focus on making your vision clear to the electorate. Don't engage in verbal abuses, fake news or speeches. Keep dealing with issues that will bring progress. You win the hearts and minds of the people by being above board by being civil, patriotic, and showing empathy. Let's join hands to make the 2023 elections peaceful. A message from the National Orientation Agency. As the 2023 elections draw near, remember, evil prospers when good to warn them not to do your part to make peaceful elections happen. Children are confessional orientation agency. Noah. All right, thank you for staying. This is Daybreak reaching you from the nation's capital on Trust Television. Now, it's top of the hour. Let's take a look at the headlines again. Counter directive. FG reverses itself on reopening of universities. Gunmen abduct Plateau traditional ruler. National greed begins recovery after crash to zero megawatts for seventh time this year. Now let's take a look at the details. The federal government has withdrawn its circular, which ordered vice chancellors, pro chancellors, and government councils to reopen federal universities. A circular on Monday afternoon signed by the Director of Finance and Accounts of the National Universities Commission, Sam Onazi, withdrew that order asking all pro chancellors and chairmen of, of governing councils, as well as vice chancellors of federal universities, to take note. Earlier in the day, a circular tagged NUCES 138, Volume 64 135, addressed to all vice chancellors, pro chancellors, and chairmen of governing councils order them to reopen universities. But the country circular said the circular stands withdrawing, with, stands withdrawn, noting that further developments will be communicated to all relevant stakeholders. This will form part of our discussions today on Daybreak. All right, now we'll take a look at uh, other stories. Uh, we have also the gunmen in the wee hours of Monday abducted a traditional ruler in Tao, chiefdom of Pangxing, local government area of Plateau State. The abducted chief is the Ngolong Tao, a third-class chief, Alahaji Dabo Gutus. The incident was said to have occurred at about 1 a.m. A resident of the chiefdom said that the people are still trying to contact the abductors to know what the exact problem or situation is. Prince Dakup Ezra, member representing Pangshin South State constituency, called for calm on the issue, saying that the safe return of the chief is paramount. He called on the people of the chiefdom and the constituency in general to go about their normal business and refrain from any act of provocation or taking the law into their own hands. When contacted, the police public relations officer of Plateau State Command 
Alabo Alfred confirmed the incident, adding that investigation was ongoing. Now, the national grid crashed to zero megawatts at 10.51 a.m. on Monday, causing a nationwide outage. The development occurred days after electricity consumers said they had enjoyed improved supply. The national electricity grid, as at 10 a.m. on Monday, had 3,712 megawatts generated from 21 Jenkos before it dropped to zero megawatts one hour after. According to the information from the system operations, only a section of the transmission company of Nigeria, AFAM 4, was on the grid, but with zero supply as at 12 noon. As of Sunday, the highest generation was 4,100 megawatts, while the lowest was 3,652 megawatts. Since July 1st this year, consumers said power supply had increased in their various areas. Meanwhile, national system operators data showed that the grid which collapsed at 1051 has commenced a gradual recovery. A large number of people, mostly women and children from Baburuga, Barawa, and Zoni, Kaladu, Sabongari, and Baraka communities have moved into the ancient city of Katsina. The people fled their villages to escape the insecurity, leaving all their belongings behind. Abdullahi Amadi had an interview with some of them. Here's the report. <laughs> These displaced people arrived Katsina confused, without food and shelter, and since they have nowhere to go, they are at the mercy of the elements. The reason for the flight was the massing up of terrorists armed with dangerous weapons around their villages planning to launch attacks. The terrorists, they say, had even threatened to burn down their villages if they made any attempt to inform security operatives about their presence and whereabouts. <laughs> The terrorists were first seen gathering around 5 p.m. at Baikiawa, one of the scenes of recent attacks on other villages, prompting the villagers to inform security operatives. But the help did not arrive until 8 p.m when the Nigeria Air Force fighter planes on other security operatives were mobilized to disperse the terrorists. However, by then, the people had started their migration to Katsina City. <laughs> Observers say at the wake of this heightened insecurity in Kazma State, a huge humanitarian crisis is imminent. Abdullahi Ismayamadi, Crossed Television News, Kazana. Now, the Nigeria Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, has predicted flooding in 27 states of the Federation, including the FCT. Motorists around Jabi Motor Park in the FCT have expressed concerns over flooding that have submerged the roads. Usman Bello visited Jabi and files in this report. This is Jabi Motor Park, one of the major interstate travel parks in Nigeria's FCT. This very busy road that connects Jabi to Utaku Market and Uye in Abuja 
has become a major worry for road users during the rainy season. Motorists say this road at the entrance of the park face annual flooding. But this year has worsened as a result of the illegal structures were demolished, which as a result blocked the waterways. So we are here since this road, as it is every day, now so it will be every year when the rain started falling. So for this year, because of this demolition that happened here, all the drainage that we are this year, they don't block, every year don't block. This place is spoiling our tire, and for a person like me, my tire is bought like two for that route. The road has become a public nuisance for commuters and those in the transport business say they have incurred heavy financial losses. This water has constituted has been constituted constituting a menace, disturbing my activities, loading and offloading activities for the past two years. As we are seeing, it is not the excess damper that constitutes this water. We were told from the Liquid Waste Department of Abuja Environmental Board that there is a structural defect from a sewer line that connected Jabi Axis to Utako Axis. Authorities have said this year's flooding is one of the worst in over a decade. Lives and properties have been lost with thousands displaced in some parts of the country. Osman Bello, Trust TV News, Abuja. All right, we will now take a short breather and then when we return, the program continues. Please stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. You're watching Trust TV's Daybreak, the morning show. And now it's time for us to take a look at other discussions on the program, talking about the uh, ASU impasse. We've seen the back and forth between the federal government and the ASU uh, court or the letter uh, ordering uh, vice chancellors to reopen the universities. Uh, and the reactions that have trailed. Yes, we've seen that uh, that order has been withdrawn by the National Universities Commission, uh, but we're going to be talking about that this morning, and we have joining us Dr. Abdurrahman uh, Buhami, a lecturer uh, from the University of Abuja, who joins us virtually to talk about this. Thank you so much, Doctor, uh, for joining us this morning on Daybreak. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Now, we have seen several reactions trailing the court order uh, by, uh, I mean, asking ASU to discontinue with this strike. And then following that, yesterday we also saw another letter uh, to the effect that, uh, you know, chancellors, vice chancellors should uh, reopen the universities. What's your take on the recent developments as far as ASU strike is concerned? Well, thank you for your question. Um, that the government has gone to court uh, because in a democracy where you have competing interests, uh, whenever there are impasse and we don't have solution to it, instead of resorting to fighting, to quarrel, to verbal attack, to
is saying that we can give you what we want and then we can keep our children at home forever. So there must be a sort of um, uh, ice breaking and the ice breaking is the court that the government has approached to interpret the law. And then you have a court order and the court order by its very nature, though the substance of the case is, read, is yet to be held and determined, but the court order is saying that ASU should go back to the classroom. And ASU is saying that they're going to appeal the, the case. And based on my own understanding about law enforcement in this country, is that appeal does not constitute a stay of execution. So once there is a judgment, uh, the parties are bound to comply with such a judgment. So it's yet to be seen, because, okay, as well as even made its position known that uh, uh, as a body, it is not going back to the classroom until um, its conditions are met. So that again is another uh, ball game altogether. Dr. Hamisu, how did we even get to this point where the matter became a court issue? Because the last time uh, we checked, there were negotiations, there were committees set, you know, and there was even a committee that was set up that was headed by the Minister of Education. It has vice chancellors as members. It has uh, Nimi Briggs as a member as well. Uh, and that committee is yet to submit its report. So uh, I w why did it get to this point where the government had to go to court? Has we we don't know how far has that committee gone? You see, um, even if the claimer, uh, why I said this is the fact that uh, don't forget the fact that most of the things that were talked about were things that have already been agreed upon. The only uh, issue or the only snag that brought us to this position was when ASU said government must pay uh, the members as the six month salary that we were on strike. And government is saying that we have a substituting law and the law states that uh, at the point you are on strike, you are not rendering any service. And if you're not rendering any service, you are not eligible for any payment. And uh, that brought us to where the pronouncement that no work, no pay would be applied. And that was when ASU decided a total strike, a total strike and said the strike is going to be total and it's going to be indefinite. Uh, so uh, even if the committee had submitted a report and that report uh, excluded uh, the, the six month pay, uh, I bet you ASU will not call off the strike. And if government uh, is uh, trying to be proactive uh, by seeing through the vineyard to say that, okay, no matter what we're going to do, uh, what these people are going to recommend, because uh, we, we, have a, we have a situation here. And the government is saying, what ASU is demanding for, we cannot afford. And ASU is saying, you can afford it. And that is a stalemate. And then the committee that was set up uh, to look into it, the committee of vice chancellors and, and, and so on and so forth, uh, was going to be in a serious dilemma because if they return to government to say government should pay the six month salary, uh, government will see them as taking side with ASU. And if they go to federal government to say don't pay the six month salary, uh, ASU will feel that uh, the committee of vice chancellors that was saddled with that responsibility is siding with government. So it, their situation is a very precarious situation. So this for me is the best way to go. Anytime there is any issue that has to do with labor, go to the court and let the court make a pronouncement. And then the pronouncement should be enforced. Because if we don't go this way, and we're talking about intellectuals, we're talking about people that are training our, 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 our kids to, to, to be disciplined, to be law-abiding, to be hardworking, to, 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 to honor whatever agreement they've entered into with uh, some other persons, then it be on us to start going to the court to test whatever we feel is right to, to, to for people to learn, for people to be compelled by the law to do what. So if ASU had gone to court to say, okay, government has failed in its responsibility, I think uh, that will uh, um, really place government but, in a very but bad light. But doctor, because, don't you think that uh, you the, don't expect your doctor, to start don't you think that the, the court route will further prolong the issue? Of course. But that is the only way out. That is the only way out. 
okay, how do we solve this problem? If ASU refused to shift ground and federal government refused to shift ground and nobody has gone to court, when will that, when will that take us to? And when will it end? So as for me, uh, however long it is, if we are beginning to resolve our labor dispute through the courts, I think it's better for us than for assuming as we approach the courts in the last six months. By now, I'm sure that case would have been dealt with. Or federal government approached the courts in the last six months, uh, this issue would have been trashed. But we waited for six months, nothing is achieved, nobody was doing anything in terms of um, other alternative dispute resolution mechanism to be used. So if dialogue should fail between two parties and nobody is willing to shift ground, then do we fold our arms? So for me, even if it means, though it's a painful thing to say or to even contemplate, even if it will take uh, one year to go through the court process and sort the issues the way it's supposed to be sought and follow due process. Look, democracy is about due process. It's about rule of law. It's about constitutionalism. So we should, as a nation, um, do things that will endure and will stand the test of time rather than um, live we will solve this problem. All right. So um, some of the fears that have been expressed by people who have watched this closely and people who are stakeholders in this uh, sector is the fact that if you use the court to, say, compel lecturers uh, to go back to the classrooms, what would be the implication of that on the educational sector, on the learning of students uh, in our institutions today, because we've seen that we've seen some who have, in one way or another, expressed the idea that well, uh, you are not going to have that uh, quality education, or you are not going to have lecturers who are actually be, will be going back to the classrooms with the zeal or the morale or the the passion to actually teach children in a way that they can actually learn. You see, let me underscore one thing. For choosing the profession to teach in itself is a sacrifice. The teaching profession is not a money-making profession. It is a profession that one chooses based on passion. And if you have the passion to teach, to give back to society what society has given you but but you but all but, this at the back of your mind when you are choosing but, but, but for your passion profession, to be sustained the second thing is like uh, when you use doctor, the word compulsion uh nobody can compel anybody to do anything especially as it is now but the other thing again is the ASU members are teachers and teachers are people that uh, Teaching people to be disciplined, to obey rules, to obey regulations. Doctor, now you cannot, you cannot, you cannot. Uh... Doctor, you know, you know, we've always we've we've normalized the saying that we've always said. That, well, the reward of the teacher is in heaven. That's a common saying here uh, in our climb, and uh, we've always said that. Well, lecturing is a sacrifice, a passion. Yes. But to sustain that passion, don't you think that remuneration plays a great role? in sustaining the passion of a person in whatever endeavor he chooses to, 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 to engage in. Yeah, that is quite correct. But in doing that again, uh, we shouldn't place money at the heart of everything. No profession gives you the latitude to work for government and work for yourself like the teaching program. They are like the medical doctors. They are one of the professions that are given the latitude to engage in community service, to engage in consultancies, to engage as even visiting lecturers or visiting professors that will earn you extra income. Now, if you have income coming from government and you have latitude to do other things to earn income, that equally gives you room to increase the amount that goes into your purse. But what we are saying is, you can't pay for education. Let us not deceive ourselves. The quantum of energy that is required to teach, if you want to price it in Naira times, in dollar times, 
I bet you most people cannot afford university education. They can't afford it. So if we now say that we must have it our own way, this is the point I'm trying to make, that we must have it our own way at the expense of the younger ones. Look, don't forget the fact that some teachers that taught us could not afford bicycle. They could not afford even motorcycle. But they did all of this with passion, believing that the younger generation will remember them. All so right, doctor. What I'm saying is to doctor. give people education, to enlighten them. If you want to do that based on money or the way they are paying um, politicians or local government chairmen, I bet you a lot of people will not go into the teaching profession. All right, doctor, you talked about uh, people who trained uh, your generation not having bicycles. Some persons will say times have changed. And, and you do agree with me that because of welfare, some people have left the teaching profession in Nigeria and have gone to other clubs. Yes. So away from that now, mm -hmm. I would like you to speak to the current development where the federal government yesterday ordered vice chancellors to direct the lecturers to reopen the schools. Uh, this is coming after the industrial court ruling, which had been appealed by ASU. And this uh, direct, uh, directive was issued in the morning. And in the evening, there was another uh, directive withdrawing that earlier directives. And the spokesperson said that, um, of the NUC, said it was withdrawn because the person who signed it, the director of finance and accounts, was, act, was in acting capacity. And that the minister spoke with the the head of the AUC and that they had decided to withdraw that letter. Uh, doesn't that look like there's confusion somewhere? Of course, um, it all depends on what the government is thinking. Uh, for instance, if maybe uh, after issuing that very particular directive, uh, government felt that uh, it shouldn't come as if it is compelling us to go back to the classroom and decided to withdraw it. Fine and good. All we want is a solution to this problem. And the solution will come from both parties. It must come from government and it must come from us. Because as it is now, it is the students that are suffering. And the government will tell you it is protecting the nation because it has other obligations as well as parents and students. And also will tell you they are protecting students and parents. Yet, a course that's supposed to last for, say, four years will, will, will last for five years. A course for five years will last for, and this is not even the end of strike in Nigeria, as far as I'm concerned. Because even if a student is giving one. Oh, it appears. One trillion, two point one strike. This is the fact. It's somewhere. Well, that is left for government to, to, to resolve. But the issue there is whatever we are doing as a government, as a people, as a lecturer, we should be able to place public interest above uh, private interest. And All as right. you said, so, so, times uh, have doctor, changed. You know, but we uh, have got a nation to protect first before we could pursue our interest. Okay, so, uh, so doctor. And I continue to maintain this situation, this very particular uh, point. Uh, let me learn, please. Uh, um, a government is like a father, and you've got one source of income, and you have multiple issues to, 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 to contend with. Now, we're talking about post-COVID, we're talking about banditry, we're talking about insurgency, and this is why we need to put on our thinking caps All right, doctor. to design solutions that will work. All right. Doctor, you know, I'm not sure about how your colleagues will be listening to you and, I mean, their reactions to what you are saying uh, right now, but... Uh, let me put it this way, that uh, in terms of the long-term implication that this is going to have, and based on the uh, explanations that ASU has given, uh, they said that they are doing this in the nation's interest, in the, in the country's interest, in the interest of Nigerians, in the interest of students. So it's not really about them, it's not about their personal well-being, but much more than that, it's about the where the schools are, the infrastructure in schools and all of that, aren't you concerned about you know, the likelihood of public institutions or public tertiary institutions, so to say, 
uh, becoming more like the experience that we are now having with the primary and secondary school uh, educational system, whereby private sector, uh, or I would say private universities, are the, uh, private schools are the ones uh, uh, running uh, the educational uh, system. Well, I will continue to maintain that the quality of the kind of education you get to some last extent is dependent on the quality of the teachers you have. But without commitment, uh, you may not have the kind of student you want to get. That is one. Secondly, I continue to mention this. In a poll conducted by Noi Post, and that very particular um, uh, poll was really timely. And parents and students were asked, prospective students were asked, why is it that most of you prefer to go outside this country to study? And the number one reason they gave was incessant strike in our university. First, the first thing they mentioned is academic calendar. That if you go to a Uganda university, if it is four years, it is four years you are going to graduate. And you start Nigeria University, you don't know when you are going to graduate. What about, what about the quality? And my point is, we must not use methods that... All right. Well, I didn't get that. I mentioned yes, infrastructure I'm, I'm as about number one. Access to the quality education is key. Well, can ordinary Nigerians actually pay, you know, for quality education going by the way things are going now? All right. It looks like uh, we, we've lost a uh, doctor there, but... Uh, By the vice chancellors, take care of them. And you are in this country when the wife, wives of vice chancellors were supposed to go to Dubai on a training, and they're supposed to pay 33 million naira from the university's coffer. And then, look, if you want to solve this problem, vice chancellors accountable. You cannot, the federal government cannot give money for research, and then you turn the money to, to procuring furniture. And then you now say there is no quality education. Third fund is there. Go and fund us in, in studying infrastructure. Oh. Go and check. There is fund for, and most of my colleagues are not using that. The only one they are using is to go for MSc and PhDs in, in UK, in, in Australia, in this. But that monies that are meant for research, for manuscript development, are there lying waste in third fund. <laughs> Hmm, I guess I guess doctor has a, a lot to say, but uh, because of time, we'll have to thank him uh, at this point. Dr. Hamiso, thank you very much for coming on the show this morning and for sharing your perspective with us. We we'll hope to have you again some other time. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. With that, we'll call for a short break now. We'll return. The show continues. Please stay. Every patriotic Nigerian should hear this. Any politician who means well for the people will never allow themselves or their supporters to engage in any vile and destructive activities. No politician who truly wants to serve the people and develop the nation will encourage his followers to destroy properties or take human lives before, during or after the elections. The Nigerian public must watch out for these traits and isolate any politician who encourages supporters to engage in violence. No genuine politician or patriot will cause trouble and seek to destroy the very society which they aspire to lead or develop. Politicians who have the good of the people at heart will not allow themselves or their followers to engage in violence, destruction of properties and then taking of lives. Be vigilant. By the words you shall know them. Shun violence. Stay away from politicians who want you to do so. Let's join hands to make the 2023 elections peaceful. This message is from the National Orientation Agency. No.
thank you for staying. This is Daybreak, reaching you from Trust Television here in the nation's capital. Moving on to the next discussion on the program. The crisis rocking the People's Democratic Party took a new dimension last Friday when the River State Governor, Yesom Mwike, uh, making a series of allegations against the chairman, Yocha Ayu, and the party's presidential candidate, Atiku Abubakar, among others. While the PDP is waving the olive branch in the direction of the governor, Ayu and Atiku refuse to react to his outburst. What is the mood in the camp of the PDP right now? We have a member of the PDP, Umar Sani, in the studio to give us perspectives uh, on what's happening uh, within the PDP. Thank you so much uh, for joining us on Daybreak this morning. You're most welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Well, the crisis with, within the PDP seemed to move from one state to another. Just when Nigerians will think, oh, the issues have been sorted, another one will now bust out. I'm sure you watched the interview uh, with uh, the governor of River State, uh, where he made several allegations about the, 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 the party chairman, Iyacha Ayu. What's your take on that interview? Well, let me start by saying that uh, Yes, Mwiki, the governor of River State, is a very important stakeholder in the PDP. And as an important stakeholder, he has had, uh, he has played a very significant role uh, in the party affairs. And uh, similarly, the PDP has also given him, given him a multitude of platforms where he has risen to where he is today. He has been a local government chairman under the People's Democratic Party. He has been a chief of staff under the People's Democratic Party. He has been a minister of state and even an active minister because uh, the minister left much earlier. And so he was acting in that capacity for a very long time and then before becoming a governor. So it's a symbiotic relationship. The PDP and Yes of Wiki uh, are treating each other in a very friendly manner. However, people have a way of expressing their grievances. You, you are aware that he has mobilized to, to contest for the position of uh, president, you know, under the platform of the PDP. And at the, pre, at the convention, which everybody has adjured to be free and fair, he lost gallantly to Alaja Atiku Aboka. Perhaps you will also have heard. And that's something that he says that he feels that he was shortchanged. Otherwise, he would have won the election. Well, that is politics. He probably thought he was, was going to win. But, you know, horse trading, uh, lobbying, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, political maneuvers. Of course, everybody will use his own strength to be able to win. He also uh, feels very strongly that the current chairman of the party played a role in his loss. Well, the, that is also another issue which I want to take into perspective. Uh, uh, he, it was him who said secondos must go because Uche Secondos was not performing as a national chairman. In the press conference he held, he now ch changed the statement to mean that the reason why Secundus left is not because he was not performing, but he has to give way for a southern presidency. Because the national chairman cannot come from the same place where the president will come from. So you can see, they, he, along with uh, the governor of uh, Benue State, Otom, you know, actually brought Ayu. So if you bring somebody believing that he's going to work for you and he didn't work for you, what's your growth there? It is your own fault. You, you didn't do a good no, background but, check. But, but he, we can have said that there was an agreement to zone the presidency to the southern part of the country. And that was an agreement reached by southern governors to start with, not just the PDP, but both across party lines, both governors from the APC and the PDP agreed 
that the presidency will be zoned to the south. And that discussion went further into the party. And th that, you know, also was the position of the PDP governor's forum. And, and, and that was why the decisions to uh, put Secondos aside came. Well, no. The Secondos leg was removed even before that decision was taken. Because when you are planning something, part of your plans is to remove every, any obstacle on your way. So Secondos was not removed. Be, be, even before the Southern Governor started meeting, Secondos was not removed. He got removed after, uh, uh, before they even started meeting. But beside the point, the issue of Southern Governors meeting across party lines to determine that the, the, uh, all political parties must zone their positions uh, to the South is dead on arrival. Because you don't have to go back to your individual parties to implement. And each individual party has its own peculiarities. The peculiarity of the PDP is that in the 16 years of the PDP, the South has ruled for 14 years. So there is no way that the, P, the, the, the North will agree that the, P, the, the, P, the, that the presidency should be zoned to the South again. Because they will have taken the greater part. Most people have even argued that uh, in the 16, Atiku has already contested and he has lost. So it's also a, a plus for the North, that the North has contested. Of course, good luck also contested in 2015, and he lost. And we are not counting it. And so, so the South has taken more of the chunk of the PDP. than the North. So we cannot operate in the same manner the APC or NMPP or any other party will operate. We have to look internally and say, OK, this is the way we will move forward. And allowing it uh, open is even the most gracious thing. OK, so, so what you are saying is that it didn't matter to the PDP at that time mm -hmm. that the current president was from the north. What mattered, what was uh, paramount was the party and how, how the party has fared in the past 16 years. Well, we are not, we are, we are, we are not APC. So as far as we are concerned, we, are, we do not even recognize President Muhammad Buhari as a member of the PDP. He's a member of the APC. And if the APC uh, 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 want to do zoning, then the, if, after he finishes, let them take it to the south, and which they have done, which is the, the, within the tradition of their own party. So our own but, party has our own peculiarity. But, but, different but, the, from but there. the argument is that in 2019, uh, the presidency in the PDP was zoned to the north, which is why they have argued that no southerner contested, and that's why you had Atiku Abubakar emerge as the presidential candidate of the party at that time. Okay, so if you want me to give you the synopsis, I'll give you the synopsis. In 2015, after the loss of the election, the Ekwerimadu committee was charged with the responsibility of reviewing the, why the PDP failed in that election and recommending ways towards ensuring the victory of the party in subsequent elections. And the committee recommended that the North should be allowed to, to contest twice in 2019 and 2023. That's, what the, that's the recommendation of that committee. Was it endorsed by all members of the party? It was not endorsed. It was uh, not even endorsed. It, in fact, all the recommendations of the, the party, there are four committees that actually sat to look at zoning. The Kwerimadu Committee, the Bala Mohammed Committee, uh, the Iguanyi Committee, and of course the Otong Committee. And all of them were just taken on their own face value and acted upon. Now, there was no neck decision to say, okay, we have agreed on the... In fact, only the Autumn Committee received a net endorsement. All the rest were recommendations given to the party, the National Working Committee, and there was no neck decision on the matter. However, everybody is aware of the report within the party. So if you talk about the Equerimado report, it says 2019 and 2023. They did not should contest. But in but you 20, said that wasn't endorsed. But in 2023, now if you say it was zoned, in, in 20, it, you are referring to the, 
a query module committee. So in, in, any, in any case, if we are to use that report, I would say it was not Zoom. Okay, so uh, let's say uh, let's move on from there because your candidate has emerged already. Mm -hmm. Now tomorrow campaigns are starting, mm -hmm. and some members of the campaign council have pulled out. Does that bother you? Well, it does. But again, we just have to look move forward. There is no way we can be stagnant. People have their grievances. They have expressed their grievances. We have used all means necessary to bring them to the table. The presidential candidate has followed he, uh, them to uh, London, where they held a meeting. He has come to Nigeria. So many emissaries, all uh, stake, critical stakeholders have held meetings to try to persuade them to join the campaign train. And the, the, the situation is not getting any better. Yes, all those engagements have been held. But the real issue on the table is the issue of balance in the structure of the party, mm -hmm. which is what the governor of River State uh, is strongly against, uh, the current arrangement. Uh, he says the, I mean, the presidential candidate of your party from the north, the national chairman of the party from the north, and you also have the presidential campaign DG from the north as well. So he feels that there is imbalance in the party leadership uh, structure which is why he's, he, he has refused to, to well, let go. Number one, uh, if he is a founding father, founding member of the party, as which, which he has alleged that he has been in the party since 1998, he will have studied the party's pattern. Uh, in 2010, moving to 2011, when President Goodluck Jonathan was the president of the country, our BOT chairman was Chief Tony Anini, our party chairman, was Okwesilese Mwudu. They are all from the South. There was no complaint. Nobody is complaining. That is the structure of the party. He, did, he doesn't is, this consider is a, the BOT this chair is, this has is anything a, to go by. This I mean, is a, this uh, is a, the, 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 the BOT chair, Wale Jibrin, has resigned, yes, but it doesn't look like it's something that he considers as crucial because he said in decision-making, in critical decision-making, these three are the people that make decisions, no, they are, especially it, in this season. Well, you see, the campaign DG is something that is transient. So that should not be an issue. But it's yeah. a, it's a, in fact, today, you can remove a campaign DG and replace him. If they had agreed to be part and parcel of the campaign, perhaps the, what the party was planning to do was to zone the campaign DG to the southwest, to Governor Makinde. But if, since they have refused, we have to move forward. There are also some found, uh, founding members of the party that, are, that share the same views as Governor Wiki. We have uh, uh, Jer Professor Jerry Gana. We have Jonah Jang. We have Olabodi George. All mm. those people are saying the same thing, though. Well, uh, you see, politics is about interest. When people converge in a place, they converge because of their own interest. So if you're in my interest aligns with your own, it becomes, you become partners in progress. Chief Olabodi George, for a very long time has been wanting to become the national chairman of the party. So this gives him an opportunity. If the wicked group in their arguments are able to succeed, perhaps they will consider him to say, okay, come and lead the party. So joining them was in also in his own best interest to join them. Now, uh, uh, Jerry Ghana was supporting Wiki in the primaries. And when they lost, he has to stay put and argue for um, and on behalf of their group. So there is nothing wrong with what is happening. People have the right to argue and say, okay, we are, we are for this and we believe in his, in, in his uh, leadership and we want him to, 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 to lead us and we will stand by him. However, what we should look at is the, the genuineness of their intentions and whether the call for the removal or the replacement of Ayu is, is manifestly... Uh, you know, in the best interest of the party. You know, apart from zoning, some allegations were also made about uh, the chairman of the party bordering on uh, corruption and also the way he comported, uh, he conducted himself during the primaries. I'd like you to speak to that. Well, uh, number one, I don't want to talk about allegations made because allegations are mere allegations. It is not, uh, we are not in a court of law, we are in the court of public opinion. So anybody can make wild allegations and say, you have done this, you have done that. 
merely because he feels it is his opportunity to tarnish your own image. Uh, he has said so about Sokondos, but again, he is the same person who said, no, Sokondos was not guilty of what he has accused him of incompetence, but now he was removed because he, was, he has to pave way for a southern president. So you can see that if you begin to see some of these type of statements coming out from a leader, then you don't put that thing into context and begin to argue over somebody's uh, uh, whether Ayu is guilty of corruption allegation or not. Again, if you talk about... But is this something that the PDP will be looking into? Well, or is it something that should bother the PDP as a party? It, if you make... The, the party has its own processes and procedure. If you have any allegation against the national chairman, our constitution is very clear. You report to the NEC. The NEC will cause a committee to be set up to investigate the allegation. And when the allegation is found to be true, then the, the NEC will pass a vote of no confidence on Ayu, and then he will, be, he will be removed as the national chairman. So the process is there. Making allegations but don't you on think, the, but, the But don't you think that, media that, that, that is that, insufficient? But you think that that, that, that uh, opportunity, or we we'll say that, that uh, atmosphere to be able to approach the NEC has been, uh, 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 should I say, sealed, given the fact that the NEC has taken a position uh, to show confidence uh, for the national chairman, that is passing a vote of confidence. On yeah, the no, no. The, the, before the neck, he had the information. Before the neck meeting, all he needed to do was to write to neck, and it would have been part of the consideration of neck. But he decided that the best place to do it is in the media space, and so when you make a wide allegations in the media space, it remains a subject of discussion within the media space. It is no longer a matter for determination or for education or for investigation by the party. The party, ha if, you, if you are a bona fide member of the party, you know the process. Okay, uh, now you, the, the party seems to be in a stalemate right now. PDP, I mean, we can have said, well, he is not going out of the party. What's the way forward for the PDP? And he doesn't, it doesn't look like if uh, Ayu does not go, uh, the, the, the presidential candidate of your party is going to have his support. What's, what, I mean, are you worried about the implication that this why is going should, to have why, on the chances of your party in 2023? Why should the Wikis demand be tied to Ayu? Is it because he actually betrayed him? Or is it because he is not a competent leader? Now, if you, you, you an individual or group of individuals are not greater than the, the party itself. This is a political party. A political party is greater than any individual or group of individuals within the party. All right. Um, and so Wiki cannot, in, in, in tandem, only in, in say, I, I must, must go. No. If he has, wants Ayu to go, let him pull, follow the due process of law, and then Ayu will go. All right. Uh, we gathered that uh, the BOT led by Adolfo Swabara and Governor Autumn, they are working on final reconciliation move to meet Wiki. In fact, Adolfo Swabara said a letter has been written to Wiki. Are you aware of that? And are you optimistic? Well, uh, like I said, every, every segment of the stakeholders in the party, including the BOT, are important segments in the reconciliation. Like we always say in the PDP, we have what we call uh, internal conflict resolution mechanism. And one of them is using this type of... St uh, and if it even fails, you don't, don't be surprised that even the military wing of the PDP, headed by General Babangira, will still wade into the matter. So we have so many areas where we will explore. But the, explore. the party is running out of time, won't you? Don't no, you we are not running out of time because we have about five months to the election. So there is no any time that is wasted. But the campaign uh -huh. is tomorrow. Well, c campaigns does not still remove the fact that you can bring back the member of your family into the fold and then we continue. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Daybreak and uh, giving us more insight about the uh, PDP uh, crisis, if you like. Uh, we appreciate you and we look forward to having you again. Thank you so much. Yes. Our guest uh, has been uh, a PDP chieftain uh, talking about Umar Sani uh, joining us here in the studio.
uh, to give more perspectives. With that, we've come to the end of the program for today. In case you've missed, you can always catch up across all our social media platforms. And also, we are always on YouTube streaming live 247. So you can watch us uh, right there. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. My name is Ayuba Ilya. Thank you for joining us this morning. Join us same time, same station tomorrow. My name is Stella Yaji. For now, do have a pleasant day.